So I'm with Robert Shrewsbury, who is gonna tell me about Kabbalah and Hermetics. Man, I don't even know what that even sounds like. I've heard of Kabbalah kind of, but I really don't know what that is. But uh, I guess it has to do with the ancient Egyptian and Hebrew mysticism type things. And uh, Actually, Kabbalah is uh, Hebrew mysticism and beliefs and spirituality. That's for the Hebrews, and, and the Hermetics is for the Egyptians, who run parallel with each other, and they had really many, many similar concepts, philosophies, and belief systems. As you know, Moses was in Egypt. The Hebrews were there for over 400 years. Moses left Egypt when he was about 40 years old, went into Cush for another 40 years, and came back and practiced his knowledge in Kabbalah, which is really... A spiritual form of magic. The word magic came from the word magi in the Bible and they were the wizards and the people that understand the function of controlling the elements and they were quite good at it. That's why you know Moses he goes into Egypt and then he his magic contended with the Egyptian magic and they went back and forth and pulled all kinds of things down from the from the heavens and bad things and so stuff. so you know you're talking about like in the Bible when Moses throws a stick down or somebody throws a stick down and and it turns into a snake and That's right. Stuff. That is Kabbalah and that is also hermetics. So I guess is that a real thing do you think or is that just oh, it a is. metaphor for things? It's not it's anything but fake. It's totally real. Those people had that knowledge. They were wizards. Okay, let's hear about this. Okay. Let's hear about this knowledge. As you know, when I study something, I test it. Yeah. I almost got bit a few times doing it. You dig in deep and you test it. Yep. Oh, I have tested them. So yeah, I want to know. So that's why okay, I do. I want to know what you know, man. Let's hear this. Okay, so when you're dealing with... Um, the knowledge of Kabbalah and Hermetics originally came from the Nephilim. Like it says in Genesis, and the sons of God came and came down into the daughters of men. Well, that's a big statement, sons of God. And from them, it was passed out, down to Noah and the people during the flood. And the Egyptians had it. And the Hebrews had it. Abraham, in a book called the Sefer Yetzirah, taught it. He was a mathematician. He was an astronomer and an astrologer. And he understood the word. The deepest meaning of Kabbalah means the power of the word. And you hear a lot of Christians talk about the power of the word. They understand it, but they do not understand it deeply. And they do not understand it as per Kabbalah that was taught by Abraham. And basically, when you're talking about the power of the word, you could say a word, okay? You could say any word and it would mean something to somebody if they understood it. But to say it Kabbalistically is totally different. For example, each letter of the Hebrew alphabet represents a, a cosmic omnipresent force in the universe. So the Aleph, that's the A, represents literally a god. The bet, B, represents another god, all the way to Thav, that's the T-H. And in their tradition, not only the Hebrew, but the, the Egyptian tradition, is there were 22 gods. There was actually 23 gods. The 23rd was the head god, okay? And he pulled them all together and said, let us create mankind. And now you're talking about the Elohim Council. He said, let us create mankind in our image. And so the head god, which is, you could call him Jehovah, you could call him Hashem, whatever you call him, his name has to have the number 26, where the letters are turned into numbers for it to be lawful. So Jehovah and Hashem, which they both use, if you do the numerical value, it has 26 letters. Mm. That's the numerical value of God. So the numbers mean one thing. The, number have, the numbers have to do with lawfulness. So those gods, their names are the Hebrew alphabet. Hmm. So each letter represents a god. For example, the bet is a god and he has a lot to do with polarity. And he connects with your body and your, your right eye. 
the gmail, which is the letter G, has a lot that connects with your left eye. It, ha, it, ha, it represents bounty. The D connects with one of your ears. It would mean fertility. When you say God, if you spoke it Kabbalistically, it would mean bounty and fertility for me. God, give me substance. That's not his name. Nobody knows his name. So that would be permuting that word Kabbalistically. And to do that, you would have to have made contact with the G, Gimel, which is a, is a force, an, an omnipresent force in the universe, and developed a, a rapport and a relationship with that particular God. And the D, the Dalet, which represents fertility. And if you made those connections and established that rapport, then you could say that Kabbalistically, and those forces would be here right now. They're coming right down. And that is the essence of Kabbalah and Hermetics. It's a, probably the deepest form of it that you'll ever find. So when Moses went into Egypt, he had all these formulas. It's like chemistry. You make certain chemicals together, and you have certain reactions. The MGM formula is what gave him a lot of understanding and knowledge and power. And this is taught, this stuff was taught in the school of the prophets in ancient times. Guys like Elijah learned it. You know, Elijah the prophet. Hmm. Moses learned it. He learned all he could in Egypt. And then he learned the rest of it in Cush. And when he went back to Egypt, he had that knowledge and he used that knowledge. So that is uh, the very basics of, of, of Kabbalah. Then there's another leg of it, which has to do with evocation, talking to various beings in the universe, to evoke a being, like you could evoke one of the cardinal angels, or you could evoke various angels and have them come down and talk with you. For example, at the waters of the Red Sea, now this is in the Zohar, uh, Moses had all the Hebrews there, and he had to part the waters of the Red Sea, so he evoked. Seven, that's 72 angels of God, which connect with the Mercurian sphere. And they all came and helped him part the waters of the Red Sea and also did some mental, emotional, spiritual repair on the Hebrews at that time. You won't find that in the Bible, but you will find it in the Zohar when the, rabbi, the Hebrews that were there at that time knew what was going on and they recorded it. And then so they all went into the water. It was interesting because they went into the water and it wouldn't part until they were up to their necks. They had to commit themselves. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and then it parted, and then they went through. So he was, Moses understood how to evoke those beings. So he's got beings from Mercury, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, the sun. And in the tree of life, uh, I'm going to show you the tree of life, and I'm going to take it off the wall. Give me just a minute. Okay, this is um, what we call the tree of life. Down a little bit, right there. Okay. This one here is Kether. That's the quintessence realm of, uh, of source and the highest level that you can get to. This one's Bina, Chakma, <laughs> Ma'adim. <laughs> And so on. It goes all the way down. This is a. These also. This one. This one. This one represents the planet Saturn, Mars, Jupiter, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon, and Earth. They call that Malkuth. So in the school of the prophets, these guys would. Uh, they would do exercises and make contact with these forces like this for their spiritual development and understanding. All of this is recorded in the Zohar and other books and people that have written about it. It's one of those esoteric legs of knowledge that the common person doesn't have a clue. Now, and a lot, most people don't realize this, but Joseph, and when he died, he had the Jupiter medallion around his neck. Okay. Here's one I made. It's a pinnacle of Jupiter. And you know, there's a book called The Keys of Solomon. And it's got all the seals that King Solomon used. He used them too. And what you do with a seal like this when you make it, you make it in the hour and the day of Jupiter. And then you pour it. And that makes a connection with those beings on that planet. This was one of my tests and experiments that I did. If it was Mars, it would be made out of iron. Jupiter's tin, the moon is silver, 
Saturn is led, and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot of knowledge on that. I won't go into that on, in, in any detail. But at, when the Hebrews were intact, and the Egyptians, it was commonplace to communicate with those beings. I call them interdimensional beings. They can be solid or they can be vague, if you want to call them that. So uh, anyway, so that's that one leg of Kabbalah and Hermetics is evocation. There's a guy that wrote three books. His name was Franz Barton. He died in 1956, I believe. He healed about 300 people of terminal illnesses. He was at one time captured during World War II by the Nazis, and he was tortured. They tried to get him to use his powers for the war effort. He wouldn't do it. And then he escaped, and he was, uh, and went back into Czechoslovakia. He uh, <laughs> would perform for people and walk through the air and hmm. do all kinds of things before thousands of people. If there was a drought, he would say, okay, he would talk, say a few words, and the, road, the clouds would come in and it would rain profusely and wet everything up. He was a real master. But the books he put out, Initiation into Hermetics and uh, Magical Evocation and the Key to the True Kabbalah are the most profound and deep books that have ever been published in the history of the world on the subject. Time out. He knew Kabbalah, he knew Hermetics, and he also knew the Hindu. Most people don't know this, but the power of the word and the letters of the words that were used by the Egyptians and the Hebrews were also used by the Hindus hmm. in the same way. And they would evoke those forces down and communicate with them. And they would aid them in various ways. Now people could say, well, that's worshiping other gods. Well, here's the thing. If I have a friend over there and we do things together, I'm not worshiping him. If an angel comes and talks to me or one of those beings, I'm not worshiping him. So people have misconceptions of those things and they're scared to death, frankly. I'm not afraid of it because the Bible says, search all things and hold fast to that which is true. And so in my lifetime, I've searched a lot of things and deeply searched them. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from in, so, in those regards. So I got a bunch of questions and maybe you're going to cover this. Okay. So you've got the Hermetics, which is Egyptian. Mm-hmm. And Kabbalah, which is Hebrew. Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So are they both basically the same thing? Are they different? They vary a little okay. bit in this. No, there, there must. There was a, a war. If I'm going back to remember my Bible days, in, in which I got a lousy memory, but uh, you had the Egyptian sorcerers against. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. and, and so trying to see who had the most powerful god. So is they is did. where are they drawn upon? You know, you're saying. Kabbalah is drawn upon 27 gods, 20, is there 23. Is there different well, gods? Did well, the Egyptians have they're all gods, gods that are or? in they're all gods that are in unification and subordinate and obedient to the head god, which we sometimes call Jehovah. He was the head god during the creation. But you don't worship those other gods. You understand that they're beings that are there. So 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 the the Hebrews was tapped into some gods, and the Egyptians were taught they both did. Mm -hmm. other gods, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and them gods was kind of battling each other then? Is that what? <laughs> there was actually warfare between the two, but you know, the Egyptians, in this regards, were wrong because they enslaved the Hebrews, so they were the ones with the fault. So, so can, because you're not supposed they, to enslave other people. Can can they invoke the power of these gods? To oh, they do. The Egyptians did, to, and and the war was on. Things and, and if you invoke them, they have to do. These gods have to do. Evil you things. have to learn. If you evoke those gods, you got to learn how to have control over their energy, their force, their power. And you know what's interesting is, uh, if you don't have power over it, they they can. They're not going to obey you. You know, I've done a little bit of exercise on some of those. You know, one time I, I, I tried, to, I've done very little evocation because I'm really not interested in that. Yeah. It's something that I've done to test it. And then once I found out it was possible and that it did work, and then I just kind of stayed away, th away from it because I'm more interested in the principles and the truths of it.
yeah. that I am. But I don't only read for intellectual purposes. I may do that first. And then I want to test it and get into the nitty gritty of the subject. For example, I evoked one of them, the S.H. Shun, Sh Shin, he's a god, okay? He's a fire being. Most people don't know what a fire being is. They're called salamanders. You know, you read that thing on Mark Hoffman and the salamander letter. It's not a little water dog we call a salamander. It's a being that's what we call a fire being. Mm -hmm. So there's fire beings, there's air beings, water beings, and earth beings. Okay. okay. And they're, they're interdimensional, and they're not in our dimension. They have to be evoked in order to, to communicate with one. So when you talk and invoke, then you're, you're talking opening up a portal? Oh, absolutely. You have so, to open so, up that portal, yes. So you're talking mm -hmm. portals opening and bringing... That's exactly what happens. Once in a while on Earth, a portal will, by nature or accident, will open and people see all kinds of strange things. But when you do that type of work, you open up that portal and those beings will talk with you. When I was doing the one on the shin... The SH sound. Barden says if you do this, you'll know when you're getting it right. If you start, if you get hot, you start sweating. So I was doing it and pulling that energy down, and pretty soon my wife came and she says, You are soaking wet. And I says, I know. <laughs> and so I proved it out three or four times, and then I just let it go because I'm not really interested in getting going deep in, into that stuff. But I did it to three or four of the forces. And, uh, and the Sefer Yetura, uh, Abraham says, if you need bounty, you face northward on Tuesday morning and you intone Dalet and Gimel. See, those are the two forces that bring bounty. So they had a practical application for it. It was a form of magic, but it was all taught by Abraham. He passed it to Isaac, Yishak, who passed it to Yaakov, Jacob, and Jacob was like, you remember Joseph in the, uh, Joseph of Egypt had a coat of many colors. The Bible says he had a coat of many colors. Well, that represents the planet Mercury. Hmm. And Mercury has a lot to do with enterprise, business, commerce, and transportation. It's also known as, by all the ancients, as courier of the gods. And all that was very symbolic, but if you read it in the book of Jasher, and you cross-reference it. The Book of Jasser talks about it and expounds on it a little bit more and what that means. And so, and it's a lot of study, and I don't want to get into that. I'm yeah. going to try to stick to, yeah. to, to the basics. And, uh, but there's uh, a lot that can be done to actually help people. You know, I, uh, had I not studied Barden material in Kabbalah, the Hermetics, I wouldn't have become a good dowser. Hmm. Because I got the concepts correct. You know, you read the Zohar and you say, you can say, oh, this is mysticism, okay? And it is. But it can also, it also has an application that you can use to better your life or to help your life or somebody else's life. And so, <laughs> there's another word I wanted to compare with that. So, people will say stuff about it, and a lot of times they'll say negative stuff about it. Mostly they don't understand it, and that's why they're saying that. And so I found it quite workable and quite functional in a lot of areas of my life, even for healing and stuff like that. So I've used some of that knowledge for healing, and some of the stuff I've learned, not just for myself, but I've helped a lot of other people that had problems with their health. I always flank uh, that kind of force with good nutrition. The two always work together. I'll give you an example of it. We have a rose bush out there. We've lived in this house for... 12 years, and the rose bush produces yellow, ro yellow roses, and it's never produced anything other than yellow roses, and it only produces one time a year, and that's it. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a, wouldn't mind having that rose bush produce maybe a second salvo of roses. And I thought, okay, I'm going to apply my Kabbalistic knowledge and understanding. So I went out there and uh, dealt with the rose bush, and I says, "All right." After I did, I made, made my connection in what they call the etheric realm. Anything that's programmed into the etheric realm, which the Hindus call the kasha, takes hold in the spirit realm, and then the material realm it precipitates down. If you don't put it in the upper realm, so it has time to precipitate down into the material realm, it won't work. 
So you have to appropriate it properly. So I appropriated it that way. And then I took pictures. So it was early, early spring, and I talked to the Burles Bush, and I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to produce twice. Once you produce all your flowers and they die, I want you to bud again and produce again. And there's, there's the rose bush. Lift it up, right? okay. Okay. And I'll take really good care of you. So, so you I just said it to you. Just said this to it out loud once, or I just talked to it like that, and then I did it repeatedly because oh. it's called building voltage, and so it's programmed in. You don't allow that program to slip, so sometimes it's repetitious. And so then I said, and I'll feed you and water you better than I ever have before. So we fertilized it and watered it and fertilized it and watered it and fertilized it and watered it and bud and bloomed and blossomed and all the blossoms are dying and then they came back again. This time some of them were orange. Yeah. Huh. I said, okay. My test is complete. It was, that never happened before. Never. Not in the 12 years we've been here. It was always yellow and they only produced one time. Ever. And we used to comment, well, I wish that produced some roses, rose bushes will produce time and time again. Others, my wife, her major is horticulture. And she says, some types will only produce once. That's one time for that one. Hmm. And that's all it's ever been. So it was one of my tests. So I, I test a lot of things. <laughs> but those results don't happen in 24 minutes or 24 hours. Right. They, they're, they're long duration, and you got to be patient, and you got to watch. And uh, I, I, get in, I get into that, and then... Uh, those, those, those kind of tests that I yeah. do. You know, it's, um, but one thing that I will say on defense of Kabbalah and Hermetics, in, a, in a, an example, you get on the web and you read something, right? For example, you read about homeopathic remedies. Mm -hmm. And if you get on Wikipedia, it says it's a pseudoscience. And they go on and on and on. Basically, what's really going on there is competition between the medical people and the nature paths. They can say anything they want. But I got shingles one time really bad, and I brought up homeopathic remedy, and it completely knocked it out. Mm. My brother Val got shingles once. He got a homeopathic remedy. That was 10 years before I did. Completely knocked it out. Mm. The only thing you have to remember about a homeopathic remedy is the protocol. Never eat anything that has mint in it, while on it, or caffeine. Uh, camphorated oil. It'll kill the homeopathic remedy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will slip up on that, but yet the web will say they're pseudoscience. I find those, like for example, I was doing some metallurgy, and I was doing some analysis on this ore for this company, and it had a lot of ferric 60 in it. You get on the web and it'll say it's a rare isotope of iron and you never find it unless it says little teeny meteorite somewhere that came from Mars, maybe at the bottom of the ocean. Well, this ore, where it came from is millions of tons of ferric 60. Hmm. So you say, why don't they know this? They are scientists much greater than I am. I had it analyzed by several different people. I analyzed it myself. Maybe it's a strategic metal and they don't want that known, but they get their way because they make their publications. Yeah. And the chemists and the metallurgists and the scientists all believe it. Mm -hmm. But I've seen many examples of that in science where I can nail it down because I know enough about science, I can do it. And then I was looking at this pillar in Delhi, India. They claim it's 1,600 years old, but I think it's quite a bit older than that. And it's a couple hundred feet tall or something tall. Got really good writing on it. And it's made out of iron, but it's never oxidized. Hmm. Ferric 60 will not oxidize. Really? Nah. It's just like platinum. Hmm. So again, somebody is controlling the knowledge and the understanding and the science. So what do you do with that? You know, you can't argue with them. Most people believe everything they see, and I test everything I see. Yeah. But if I feel like it needs to be investigated and looked into, so when they say something about, yeah, Kabbalah, it's, it's Jewish mysticism. So when I was in uh, Latin America, mainly Guatemala, working with the Mayans, I learned, the, I learned their calendar, the Tzolkan, the oldest calendar on earth. And it has a lot to do with their spirituality and their, and their religion. And I tested it. 
just like I do everything else, and it turned out to be absolutely correct. Mm. So it's like, unless you really test something and really know for yourself, you don't really know. Right. There's a lot of things that we know that are, if, if it wasn't for science, you wouldn't have driven up here in that pickup. That's true. So they have truth, and without that truth, there would be no function like we get. So there's a lot of merit. I've learned a lot studying studying science. It became my it was my foundation of learning. But then there's physics, there's quantum physics, and there's metaphysics. Metaphysics is a form of quantum physics. So you read the Zohar and you say, I was reading in the Zohar and it says that Saturn used to be a sun. You don't like the sun in the sky, and. She volunteered to condense her light and become a planet so she could give birth to humanity. Hmm. I thought, that's pretty mysticism, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, do you really believe that? I, thought, well, I don't know. I'll give it some merit. I'll think about it. And so, less than two years ago, NASA discovered and published the fact that Saturn, they now know that Saturn used to be a sun. Really? And she condensed into a planet. Mm -hmm. Really? I keep finding stuff like that. And wh where did you find that at? It was on, on one of the YouTube videos. I punched in NASA. I it's, mean, where, where did you find it? It was in the Zohar. Oh, it was in the These Zohar. These books right here that are about 2,000 years of rabbinical comment on the Torah. So how do they know? Hmm. So you see, where, you see where I'm coming from. It's like, you can say something, that's all BS, but unless you have a reference to it. Right. Unless you can, uh, this but these books here. There's three of them. There's 22 volumes of the and the Zohar. I have those and I've gone through them. But it's, it's packed with knowledge and a lot of it is sequitur and parallel to science. So far, so I can't argue with that. It's not an accident that those things go on. So I have to give it credit where credit is due, and and, and I do. So it's kind of interesting. Another thing I, t I did, according to Barden, he said polarity, the letter B is the second letter of the alphabet. According to him, the bet under God was the head of all creation. But he also says the bet controls polarity of all things. And he says, he or he that controls polarity is the master of all things. And I find it's kind of funny that I learned a lot about polarity and I've used it for helping people. Mm -hmm. I, I used it in dowsing. It's very, very important. And I'll give you an example of polarity and, and tell you, and this all came from my research in Kabbalah and my tests and my experiences. Every organ in the human body has a north and south polarity. There is no exception. It may be in micro Teslas, but it's magnetic. I drew this. This is the top of the human head, right? Move it over that way. Well, hold on. The block, yeah. the block represents South Pole. And this is South Pole. This is your front right lobe, it's North Pole, and your back lobe is North Pole. So it's I call it a quadrupole. And this side view, another side view, front view. Front view. No, that's the way. Okay. And you deal in with a human heart organ. It's the same. Want to be south, south, north, north. Okay. So, Barden healed the 300 terminal cases. He says that if the polarity is off in an organ, okay, you're either getting a disease or you have a disease. Hmm. And the 300 terminal cases that he cured, all he did was correct the polarity in their organ. Really? Mm hmm Another guy did that. Ruth Montgomery wrote about him. The book's called Born to Heal. His name was William Gray. In the book, she called him Mr. A because he didn't want his name out. But he killed so many people in California that the FDA went after him. And he got a lawyer who he'd, either, he'd healed the, the lawyer's father. And they defended him in the court of law, and the state of California gave him a license to heal. He was using that system. Okay. Yeah. There's been others that have used that system, but not very often. A lot of faith healers, like William Branham, healed strictly by faith. There's ways that people have healed. So I tried this application. I had an acquaintance that had terrible cluster headaches and couldn't get rid of them, and had them for 10 years. So 
I got a picture of the person and I tested it with my dowsing and the right front hemisphere was North Pole and it was if you measured the Teslas on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 1 to 12, 12 would be normal. This person was 1, mm. really low, so I just charged it with north polarity. How, how, uh, how do you charge it? How do you do that? Well, there's two ways to do it. One of them, you just do it mentally. You think of the color white, like fire, white fire. Did you ever look at a blast furnace? With a, it's white white, white. You use your imagination. Mm -hmm. Image things. I've done a lot of exercise to develop my imagination, the ability to image things. So you just look it up and you just put that right in their head. So I'd do that. I'd do that and do that. And then, then I tested it and it went back to normal. I thought, okay, I'll wait for the results. The next day, <sighs> the spouse called me and says, first time in 10 years, I have not had a headache. Mm. Okay. I checked it off. So oh. you used your dowsing rods to see? Absolutely. To detect the polarity in anything. Minerals, elements, people. It doesn't matter. So, so dowsing, you could do dowsing to heal yourself? Dowsing to... Well, for diagnosis and for detection. Diagnosis. diagnosis and detection. When I got out of the hospital... As you know, I almost died there a few times. Yeah. They did an oblate. I, I, I heard you was on the way checking Oh, I out. was. I wrote a will. I, I was gone. Yeah. And so I, they sent me home to either die or see what I would do. They did an ablation on my heart where they stick a tool up your main artery and they cauterize your heart to keep the signals from bouncing over and, and disturbing your heart rhythm. And so I got on, the, went in the other room. And I got a picture of a heart, and I got a picture of myself, and I doused the quadrupole of my heart. And one chamber was so weak and polarity, it was almost dead. And so I charged it up. And the next day, it was normal. After a couple of days, it went, it went bad again, and I charged it up again. This went back and forth for about a month. And my heart started working right. Not till then. So. So, so. Let me see if I get this right. You you figure out where the polarity's wrong in in whatever you bought, and then correct you, it, and it, then and then you collect correct it with with your imagination. Carry, call them prayers, imaginations, sure. visualization, visualization. You know, and you just pump it into the organ where in the right place, and it could be in your brain, it could be your pancreas, your liver, your spleen. Your gallbladder, your intestines, your lungs, it doesn't matter. And if you feed it that energy and just keep pumping it in, it will change that polarity. One time I experimented before I even got ill, and I thought, okay, here's my brain. This one's North Pole, this one's South Pole. I think I'll make this one South Pole. So I worked on it for about 20 minutes. Oh, God, I was ill. <laughs> I could hardly walk and keep my balance. And so what I did was I put it back. So I just started charging it with the, the right polarity until, and then I was okay. You know, sometimes you experiment, sometimes you can get hurt. You got to be careful about that. Scientists don't experiment on themselves, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I was, anyway, so and I've done that for a few people here and there in every case. And every case that I did that, I corrected them. And it didn't matter if they're on the other side of the planet. If I had a photograph of them, their name, their date of birth and place of birth. And so somebody named somebody, you know, like Robert Shrewsbury, there's dozens of them in this country. Dozens of them in England. So if I had somebody's name and I didn't have a picture of them, birth, where would that go? You got to identify the person when you put out that energy. And basically you access the etheric realm, which is the, what the Hindus call the Akashic realm. That's the cause realm. It's even used in witchcraft. So what the witchcraft people do, I've written two articles on witchcraft and how it works and how it functions. And they use the same principles that the holy men use. It's like the knife that cuts the bread. You can cut it, you can use it to cut the bread or hurt somebody. 
Yeah. It's the so if you do it for good, then you're a saint, and if you do it for evil, then you're a devil. Yeah. That's the only difference in the principles that they use in harness. So, and that's what the ancients used. And for, but you know, if you're praying for somebody that they'll get help, that's a good thing. But a lot of people pray that somebody will get harmed and hurt. So now you're drifting into witchcraft. Yeah. That's why when somebody really does you in, you're just supposed to pray that they'll change their ways and they'll get better and that they'll repent and leave it be. You have to put it in his hands. Otherwise, you will be practicing the dark side of the knowledge. That's and that'll come back on you. That's karma. Mm. You can't do that. Yeah. And uh, so. So so I have had an experience, many experiences, where exactly what you're talking about. So, so I don't want to talk about it, but okay. But, uh, but uh, 100 percent, I I've had, and I'll call them I call them miracles, happen. But it's doing exactly what you're talking about. You know, visualizing. Um, yeah. And, and I, I did a combination of visualizing and, and praying, and, and, and it's it, 100 percent it, it worked. You know, I can't, yeah, it I does. can't deny it. Especially you know? repetition of it. And that, you keep bumping it. It was repetition mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, it, it, it does. It, it was, I, that's all I thought about from the time I woke up till the time I went to bed. And it works. Happened. It, it works. works. Oh, it absolutely works. You know, one time, I don't know if you've ever been hit with this or not, but I've been hit with sorcery and witchcraft before. Really? Oh, yeah, people that wanted to do me in. Really? Mm hmm I want to ever say who they are. So it's, it's nobody's business. But uh, just sometimes, you know, if you're in the arena and you're doing things and you're active in various areas, then you flag various forces and peoples, and some of them may not like what you do. And so they can do that to you. If you're not doing a lot and you're not making waves in the political arena or anything like that, then nobody has a reason to. Yeah. But at one time I was I was really active in my Native American work, okay? And <laughs> I raised a lot of havoc. It wasn't for bad, it was for good. Uh, you helped get Peter McDonald a pardon. He was chairman of the Navajo Nation and was incarcerated in Bradbury, Pennsylvania. I even took a trip to him, visited him there, and I flagged a lot of hostility <laughs> doing that kind of work. And um, but I got through it. And uh, when that happens, there's also a formula to dissolve witchcraft. Hmm. If you that know the formula, sense. you can neutralize it. Hmm. So I didn't know it until that happened, and then I learned the formula because I had to. Yeah. And so, but there are forces that do that all the time, and, and they practice it. Well, there's several things to connect to, to connect to the upper realm, the cause realm, that the ancients did. The human body, there's certain things that you can do that relate to the human body or any body that will cause a connection to the Akashic realm. And I'm being... I'm not being vulgar. I'm being right. One of them is in the sex act, and that connection's in your semen, and it's also in your blood. That's why the Hebrews, they would pray, and they would have the altar with the fire, and they would sprinkle the calf blood and the cow blood on it. That sends their signals up to the, co to the cause realm. That's why they use blood and witchcraft mm. and sex. Mm. And you notice when they did an animal, it had to be a flawless animal. It had to be very healthy. And uh, the witchcraft people do it too. Okay, But finally in the Old Testament, God amended that. And he says, I don't need your blood. I don't need your cattle. I have thousands of cattle on thousands of hills. What I need is a sincere heart. So that goes a lot further with God. So you don't need that to connect to that realm if you, if you know how to connect to that realm. And I've taught that to a few people. You can connect with it. So what, there's a book called Moonchild. It's by Alistair Crawley. He was called by the English press the wickedest man on earth. And he was. And he would have these covens and he'd do the most evil things that you could do because witchcraft gets it straight from the destruction, annihilation, and desecration of goodness. Mm. Wholesomeness, purity. 
And that's where they, their power is only temporarily, but that's how they get it. And he wrote the book, and he died, and on his deathbed, he says, you can't do anything that you don't have to pay for in this world. It was kind of a deathbed realization, and he did say that. Mm. But in, in the COVID, he, he found the most wholesome, beautiful woman he could possibly find. He married her, and then he desecrated her. He had the COVID gang raper. When she got pregnant, they took the baby out to Syria and ate it in front of her. Mm. And she turned and looked at him. He had a lot of charisma. And on her dying breath, she said, I still love you. I don't know how she could say that, but here's the thing. It destroyed the COVID. Because mm. that kind of, that's more power than the evil. Mm. But it's interesting, but that's how the witchcraft people do it. And to, to this day, and they usually use human blood when they can get it. So anyway, that's, uh, like I say, I wrote two articles on it. If anybody wants those articles, I'll be glad to send them to them. You know, it's okay to put my email address on the video. So, what's what's your email address? It's Robert Shrewsbury at Robert Shrewsbury twelve at gmail dot com. Okay. I like that word Gmail. It's one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet that has carries the bounty. I'm being humorous, but that's what it means yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in Hebrew. So, so when you you said the COVID, mm -hmm. what, what you're not talking about the thing you're t talking about like a coven or a or a coven? A, oh, coven! A coven, a witch's coven. Okay. Where they do dark witchcraft and evil stuff and human sacrifices and stuff like that and blood and they do a lot of they you do a lot of child rape and stuff mm -hmm. like that in those covens. That's why. Uh, you know, every every dog has its day, and I believe the day's coming and that'll be rolled up and cl our society will be clean out of it. But, you know, I studied a lot of that stuff to know what was going on. That was my purpose. It wasn't any other reason. But, you know, you need to know what's going on. Well, there was a guy, and I, I forget his name. I could find it. And he had a, he, he belonged to the Church of Set, and he lived in California, which means the Church of Satan. Mm. And there was over 60 children that were molested by him. Mm. And there was such an uproar among the people that the government wanted him because he knew so much, so they took him in, to the East. And he's still alive and they still protect him. Really? Mm-hmm. That's a, you know, we have some leaders that are not good people. Mm. I mean, the guy should have been convicted and brought to justice. Yeah. You, know, you know what I mean? If he did it to one child. Yeah. And, and But that's how he gets his power, by the destruction, the annihilation, and desecration of good. So that is the heart of witchcraft right there. But the methods and the, to the tools and the principles that they use are the same that Moses used. So it's just a matter of whether they use it for good or for evil. You're going to go right or are you going to go left? And if you go, if you go left, that's the evil side, analogously speaking, okay? If you go right, then that's the, the the righteous side, and that's all there is to it. So, so, so you're saying that these people get get uh, power from from hurting people from doing that. How do, how do the 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 good people, if it's the same power, how do they get there? They used all the applications except the blood, and the murder, and the rape, and the the evil. They don't use that. They use a sincere heart. Ah, uh -huh. it's all it takes. It does the same thing. But you're not going to go to the dark side with a sincere heart, are you? Makes sense. Yeah, I could do that. They'd laugh you all the way out of the building. So, and some people, they're hungry and they want things and they're covetous and they say, well, I want a, a quick way of doing something. I want the easy way. I mean, the famous Dr. Faustus did that about 300 years ago in France. And he was getting older and he... He's having a hard time, so he evoked an evil prince by the name of Mephistopheles. And Mephistopheles told him, well, you have your, we'll own your soul, but we'll give you what you want. So he'd become young and good-looking and handsome. He was very wealthy. He had an inn where they would have music and wild orgies and parties, and he just loved it. And he got to thinking about it because he had had a good religious upbringing in a Christian church. 
he realized that he had made a serious mistake. This is a story that's been around since 300 years. And so he repented. He fell on his knees and he asked God to forgive him. Well, he went back to the inn and they killed him. When people went in to look at the inn, he had an eyeball on the ceiling and one on the wall, and his whole body was dismembered and strewn throughout the building. So to say you never make any kind of an agreement with anybody except your Heavenly Father or Jesus Christ. So that must be understood with, on the good side, and they don't, you know, they don't. But there's been a lot of people that did that. But there's been people that learned Kabbalah, like uh, Roger Bacon, he learned Kabbalah. He was about the time of, um, in England, about the time of Queen Elizabeth and through there. And he did miracles in front of people. And, but he always did it for good. And when he died, he torched, before he died, he torched his library. And they ask him why he did it, and he says, I don't want this knowledge into the hands of the wrong people, and I would be responsible for it, and I would be held accountable for it in the hereafter. Mm. So he did that. Queen Elizabeth herself, she had a mentor by the name of John Dee. Mm -hmm. He was a scholar, but he was also a Kabbalist. And she used him a lot. He expelled a, a hex that was put on her from her enemies and saved her bacon. <laughs> and uh, he also corrected the Gregorian calendar. And there was so much jealousy among scholars, there still is, it hasn't changed, that they wouldn't accept his changes until a hundred years after he died. Mm -hmm. They had to accept him because he was right. But they did it begrudgingly. So he has a lot of rivalry in that arena too. And that's kind of, kind of interesting. But you know, it, it brings to thought Another thing that I'd like to express, and that is, again, search all things and hold fast to that which is true. And I've done a lot of that in my lifetime, but the average person wouldn't think of it because they're afraid of it. You know what the Bible says, he that is fearful or covetous will be taken in a snare. I'm not fearful. I'm not afraid of it. I've admitted a few times in my learning. You know, one time I evoked a cardinal angel, and, that's, and I didn't know at the time because it was many years ago that you never ever do that huh. unless it's a life or death situation and there's no you know and I did that and boy I tell you he come and I uh, my little teeny body he picked it up and pinned it against the wall like you'd stick a BB on the wall and, with super glue I just sit there he said what do you want and I said well I'm a student of Kabbalah and Hermetics and I uh, so much that we read is inaccurate and incorrect here on earth. You can't sort it. And so I tested it, and that's my only purpose. I was sincere, and he says, okay. Let me tell you, I never did it again. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> you can't. But I learned better afterwards, and I learned what the rules were. But that was why I'm talking about getting bit. You got to be careful when you're doing that. If you ever do any of that kind of work. I never had a mentor. I never had a teacher. I pioneered it myself. So, what do you do? You want to learn, you're thirsty for knowledge and, and understanding. You're thirsty for wisdom, then you do what you can to get it. And so, speaking of searching all things, and a lot of people will just write it off as witchcraft or sorcery, like, like the Spanish when they were in Central America, they burned 10,000 Mayan books. They were good books. It was witchcraft and sorcery is what they said. And they weren't. They were not. The Mayans did not practice that. He went back to Spain and he was honored for that. And then later in life he repented and says, I did wrong. Those were good books. There was a lot of knowledge there. It's all been lost. And the Mayans retaliated and buried all of their libraries and books, never to be found. And unless it's safe to do so, it's still not safe to do that. Mm -hmm. The only book that survived was a book called the Popol Vuh. Mm -hmm. I have that book. Have you read it? I haven't. It's mostly mm -hmm. pictures, isn't it? I learned a lot from the Mayans that I can understand a lot of it because of the concepts and their philosophies and their terms. But you just about have to do that to understand that book, but it's an awesome book. So anyway, so I learned from the Mayans. Now, remember that Abraham and the Egyptians both studied and practiced astrology. And so we look at astrology, oh, that's bullshit, that's BS. Oh, it's just, but nowadays, astrology that comes from 
the Hebrews, as well as Egyptians, is mostly for entertainment. But they had a purpose in it. There's a guy here that wrote a book on it. It's called Witness of the Stars by Bollinger. And he shows many, many, many references in the Bible where they use astrological terms. And nothing has ever happened in the world in the Old Testament that was not witnessed by the formation and position of the stars, including when Jesus Christ was born, Jupiter and Venus were eclipsed hmm. at his birth. Jupiter is the planet of justice and religion. Hmm. Venus is a planet, planet of love and procreation. So, that, but, so I, I never through, I don't follow astrology that way, but I never threw it away. I had to consider it. And so, so I'm a Pisces. Do I have some of those characteristics? Of course I have some of those characteristics. But Abraham says you can study this and you can learn this, but never allow it to dominate your life or control your life. And this study isn't for the layman anyway. It's for the priests. Mm. So I, it had a purpose. Okay, so, so I, I studied that briefly, but not deeply. And then I went, when I spent some time with the Mayans, I studied their calendar, which was the Tzolkan calendar. It's a 260-day calendar, and they call it a spiritual calendar. And it's got 20 astrological signs, okay? And it has uh, 13 harmonics. And it's so deep... <laughs> Spiritually speaking. Oh, by the way, Wayne May, just his last publication, there's a picture of my wife and I with Chief Jake, Jake Thomas and, and his wife. He was chief, chief of the Cayuga, ah. Iroquois. And so I put that in the article that I published, and Wayne May published it. In the Ancient American Magazine. Yeah, it's in there this month, yeah. It was basically about the peacemaker and who he was, and basically he was Jesus Christ, hmm. known as to them as the, the God of Weda. What was that? Well, after I come out and spending some time with the Mayans, I did a bust of a Mayan priest. Okay. <laughs> when I spent all that time with the Iroquois, and I spent a lot of time with them. I did a bust of one of their famous characters in history. Let me see, where's that at? So once I have hands-on with somebody, I like to make that spiritual contact. So I did this one of Atorahu. He was the first sachem of the Six Nations of the Iroquois 2,000 years ago. Nobody knows what he looks like. I just use my imagination. Yeah. So anyway, here is the Tolkien calendar. I just drew this up and I took off the I took off all the Mayan glyphs and the, I took off the Mayan numbers and put them to our number system. So this is goes from one to thirteen, and this is twenty Mayan signs. Okay, and as the sprocket turns, so like this one points right here would be like uh, Ajmak, seven harmonic, and the next one would be Tzikin, and its harmonic would be six. And the next one, as this turns, and it'll go through all of them with 13 harmonics for every 20 signs in 260 days. Hmm. So, and that relates to their astrology. So he says, so I ask him, I said, what's the purpose of your astrology? Is it, for, is it frivolous or is it spiritual? Is it for a purpose? And they said, oh, the 20 signs represents everything that you were given in the pre-existence and the program that you were given for your development here on earth. Nothing more. And everybody was given something to overcome, something to develop. They were given good qualities and bad qualities, so when they came here, they could develop. Hmm. So I says, well, what's my sign? And he says, I know your sign. I said, what's that? He said, you're 11 Toch. Oh, okay. What does the 11 mean? He says, well, the numbers go from 1 to 13. You could have been 1 ta or 2 or 3 or 4 or all the way up to 13. But the 11s is a sign of karma. It doesn't mean that you did anything bad, but they give that to you as though you did because you're tried and tested all of your life. But its purpose is to develop you. 
If you weren't tried and tested, you couldn't be developed spiritually. And I said, so what does the ta mean? The sign, he says, unfortunately for you, it's also the only sign of karma. So you have double karma this lifetime. But your destiny is knowledge. No, they called it. And you've been studying all your life, and you'll do it until the day you die. Mm. And I said, well, that's true. So I, I learned the astrology, and I recorded it all, and got it interpreted into English, and studied it some. But the most important thing is this. He says, they, they do a vision quest. Are you familiar with that word? Kinda. Many Native American people have what they call a, a vision quest. They'll send you out to the wilderness and you'll draw, do a circle and you'll pray and you'll ask for answers. And you might be there for a day or two or two or three days. And then the, the angels will come and give you a message called a vision quest. The Mayans do it and they do it very different. What they have you do is you go out on the day of your Mayan birth, so I would go on 11 Ta, which cycles every 260 days, to your quintessent, and that's a vortex, or a, a portal. And they said they go all the way around the Earth. They might be, like your sign may be here, and then it might, 200 miles away, it may appear there again, and another 200 miles, and another so many hundred miles, it goes all the way around the Earth. And, I said, well, I should like to do my vision quest. And he says, we've never taught it to anybody. I said, what happens if you do your vision quest? He said, well, you'll be enlightened like you've never experienced in your entire lifetime. And when it's over, it'll develop you spiritually that would normally take 50 years of learning, and you'll have it. I said, okay, so I come back out to the United States and uh, I was determined to do it. I knew how to do the ceremony, they taught me that. So I came home one day and I had kind of a spiritual feeling. I told the wife, I says, I've got to find my quintessent. So we worked together and I found it. So I waited till the right time and I went and did my vision quest. You know, it's funny, it's at the dream mine. Really? Mm -hmm. My quintessence is at the dream really? mine. So Dean Cloward was my friend, and he gave me the keys and gave me permission to go on the dream mine. Hmm. So I went there, and then I came back to his, after I finished the ceremony, I went back to his house, and he says, you can sleep here tonight if you want. He and I were friends. So I stayed there. By the next morning, I was spiritually on fire, and I don't mean a little bit. There wasn't anything that I could possibly think of that I couldn't look at and have an answer to. Really? And it lasted for two weeks. During that two-week period that I visited people I knew, and I, I did a few healings and stuff like that. And, and uh, I never slept one trill a second in two weeks. Wow. And I wasn't tired. Hmm. Then after that, it started to fade. And after a, 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 the third week, I could sleep an hour a night. And then the fourth week, I could sleep, you know, four or five hours a night, and then I went back to normal. But 12% of it stayed with me from my knowledge, my intellect. Not much of it was permanent. The rest is gone. It's like the veil was moved. And I had to say, you know, we cannot pass judgment on other people in other places that have great knowledge. They have more knowledge. And I told the Mayan priest about that, and they said, Robert, you're the only person we know of that's ever done one. Hmm. But, like I say, I tested it. So we, my message is, there's a lot of knowledge in a lot of places. You know, don't put it down, you know. You know, I had a friend that wanted to read uh, one of Barton's books, because he wanted to learn that knowledge. So I told him where to get it, and he bought it, and he looked in it, and he threw it across the room, and it hit the wall, and he grabbed it and threw it in the trash can. And I said, John, why did you do that? He says, it's got that GD reincarnation in it. He believes in reincarnation, right? Well, personally, I don't care if it's true or not, and I don't know if it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is knowledge and understanding. But I said, do you know that uh, you, read the, you read the Bible? He says, yes. And I said, you believe in the Bible? And he says, yes. And I says, well, the people that 
at the time of the Bible that wrote it, they all believed in reincarnation. To this day, all the Jews believe in reincarnation. Mm. So are you going to throw the Bible away? Are you going to throw the baby out with the bathwater? It really doesn't matter. What matters is present time, where you're at today. It doesn't matter. But that's the way a lot of people are. They're so prejudiced and they're so, they're so bound by belief systems that they're not able to really study something and learn it and then be privileged to the benefits. So that's... And I only mention the Mayan stuff because it's like the, it's like the metaphor. Of, this is a metaphor. A guy stood on the mountain and he had this crystal sphere. And he says, I have all the knowledge there is in this crystal sphere. And, I wanted, and there were crowds of people at the bottom of the mountain. He wanted to give it to him. But he stumbled and he fell. And the crystal ball fell off the mountain and hit and busted into pieces of fragments. It just showered out everywhere. And masses of diverse peoples came in, each grabbing a piece of the crystal, saying, I have the truth. Right. So they all had some of it, but they, because of their ego, their self-centeredness, they thought they had everything. You know, it's like somebody will say, oh, I'm sure glad that I'm in the church, because we're going to go to heaven and the other people are not. That's hogwash. It's not true. God doesn't judge people by those things. In my opinion, I don't look at it that way at all. So, I agree with you. Huh? I agree with you. It's, yeah, I was like, what? You know, I was talking to one of my LDS friends, and I'm LDS, and about that, and I said, well, you know, the prophet Joseph Smith, he was praying about his brother and his father who died, and they weren't a member of the church, and if they were going to go to hell or what. And, and he was told that, no, they were good people. They'll go to the highest kingdom. Okay. I think he told the truth. So this is like, so I say, like the Bible says, search all things and hold fast to that which is true because there's so much to know. Anyway, I made some notes. Let me look at my notes. I did make some notes, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> there's a book called The Golden Dawn by Israel Regardi. It's the most well-read book in the world for people that practice different forms of sorcery and witchcraft. But at the same time, good people practice it. And they take the good out of it. At the same time, bad people take it and they use it in the bad way. And then there's another book called The Magus by Francis Barrett. It's basically similar. More brief, but similar. Okay. Okay. So anyway, can you turn that off for a minute? There's a book called Kabbalah. Okay. So there's another one. This was written by Moshe Adel. There's another one written by Arthur Waite. There's a lot of them around. They explain a lot of things, but they're mostly intellectual material. And the difference between his and Franz Barden's books is Franz Barden focuses on application and function and teaches you how to practice the principles. None of these other books do. Mm. So... And then get, say they're good for intellectual property. It's like uh, one of the Masonic books I read, Morals and Dogmas, by... <laughs> it's... It's just all intellectual stuff. It doesn't do you any good. You can't do anything with it. It's like studying about how a car runs, but you never drive, drove a car. You've never... You don't know how to drive a car. You don't have a driver's license. Well, it's not any good unless you can drive it. So that's why I make the comparison that way. So yeah. basically, the, the Franz Barden books teaches the function. The Zohar doesn't really teach the function. It's got a lot more information in it than you'll read any place else on earth on, on those subjects. And there's a lot of stuff like people don't understand. If you read those books and people talk about, for example, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, there's no such thing as the Ark of the Covenant. There's such thing as 13 Ark and Covenants that were made by the Hebrews. 13 of them, huh? Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that. And not only that, but other cultures that lived around the Hebrews during that time period, they had equivalent to it. They had their oracles that had the eagle on it and the whole thing. So they would make contact with their deities. Mm. So that's a lot of stuff you get when you read those books you get a lot of there are a lot of reading but you get a lot of perspective out of them so I always recommend people that are searchers for knowledge they go to the best source that they can find and get the knowledge that way 
All right, amigo, I'm gonna stop again. Okay. Well, Robert, I appreciate it, and that's a wrap. Hey, you're most, you're most welcome. And like I say, anybody that wants to can certainly email me and I'll send them information if they want them or sources of information that they can get them.